Hello and welcome to the lecture for week 10. This is entitled No and Thunder. And I'm going to be talking about Nathaniel Hawthorne and Herman Melville. These are two authors that had a lot in common and actually knew each other. Melville was a, a bit of a Hawthorne fanboy. We'll begin with Nathaniel Hawthorne and the two stories that I signed from him, which are The Maypole of Marymount and Young Goodman Brown. And I would like you to refer to the lecture slides that I uploaded as I go through this. Hawthorne grew up in the cradle of Puritanism, but a lot of people get confused and think that he grew up during the Puritan era and that he wrote during the Puritan era, probably because so much of his writing is about that era. He was born a hundred years after that era ended. A lot of what he writes is set during that time because he really was obsessed with that era and really obsessed with rewriting America's Puritan history. It's That era, of course, is characterized as oppressive, as hypocritical, as short-sighted. And he wanted to uh, put a perspective on it that clarified that there were people during that time that had a different perspective. But he also wanted to show that, yes, in a lot of ways, it really was oppressive and hypocritical and short-sighted. And he wanted to reveal the contradictions of New England culture. The first of these contradictions is that of the community versus the individual. Some of you may have read The Scarlet Letter, and of course, Hester Prynne is an example of that, of the strong individual that doesn't fit in with the community. In historical Puritanism, we're aware, of course, of the situation with John Winthrop and Roger Williams. Roger Williams is the strong Puritan who doesn't fit in with the Puritan community, and John Winthrop has to banish Roger Williams, even though John Winthrop seems to be sympathetic somewhat with Roger Williams' positions in certain areas. A similar conflict between the community and the individual is eventually set in Young Goodman Brown. There were other contradictions such as the idea of allegory versus symbolism. Allegory is a teaching tool. It's a religious teaching tool. Uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress was a a great Puritan novel, um, which was an allegory. Symbolism is more of an artistic form, uh, a literary form, and Hawthorne plays with that. Allegory was something that would have been accepted in Puritan literature. Symbolism is not. And we're going to see that in the two stories that you've been asked to read by Nathaniel Hawthorne. The third contradiction that Hawthorne regularly deals with in his work is that of the Calvinist concept of original sin versus the transcendentalist faith in goodness. Or to quote the New England primer in Adam's Fall, we send all. Whereas the New England transcendentalists a group with which Hawthorne shared a lot of ideas and ideals, man was good, basically good. Many of Hawthorne's characters face these contradictions and have to make choices, and a lot of times make bad ones. I'm going to start talking about the short stories in Nathaniel Hawthorne by talking about The Maypole of Marymount. It's probably clear fairly early that this was an allegorical retelling of the infamous incident of Thomas Morton's Marymount, The story that was told from the point of view of William Bradford in a Plymouth plantation, as well as in uh, or Thomas Morton's, as well as in Thomas Morton's famous poem. What I wanted to point out is that Hawthorne tells it in the form of an allegory. That the characters in Hawthorne's story are really flat representations of ideas. That Endicott and his Puritans are the ideas of Puritans, that they are more Puritan than Puritan in a way, that they are the representation of Puritans, just as the revelers, the sort of semi-magical, ultra-hippie revelers are the idea of pagan revelers, that they represent two extremes of ideas, that Edith and Edgar represent innocent youth, that Endicott represents the Puritan point of view. And Hawthorne really goes out of his way to clarify the fact that this is supposed to be an allegorical retelling of that mythic struggle that happens at the outset in America. The quote, Jollity and Gloom were contending for an empire, makes it very, very clear that we are locked in a mythic struggle from the very beginning of America.
Young Goodman Brown ups the ante, if you will, because it contains elements of allegory, fairly clearly elements of allegory, and you could read it that way. You could read it as an allegory, but you'd be missing a whole lot of depth because it contains some really complex symbolism that makes it move beyond allegory. Uh, and that's because of the ambiguity here, that, that Hawthorne is interjecting ambiguity. And that's not to say that the Maypole of Marymount doesn't include ambiguity. It really does, especially in the ending. Um, the way that Edith and Edgar leave Marymount is very ambiguous. So I'm not discounting ambiguity as being part of the Maypole of Marymount. I'm just using it, I'm just using the Maypole of Marymount to build into Young Goodman Brown because Young Goodman Brown is is more complex of a story and to talk a little bit about ambiguity and what ambiguity is is uncertainty so with allegory allegory is basically using uh, symbols to tell a story so we're using using characters to represent ideas symbolism of course is using concepts to represent other things to represent other things and in young goodman brown we have very clearly some symbols there right we have the character of faith and Faith could very clearly be an allegorical character, right? We could have the the wife whose name is Faith could represent Faith. That's a very John Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress-esque character. That the wife whose name is Faith represents the concept of Faith. She could also be symbolic of Faith, right? Because she, when he loses Faith, when young Goodman Brown loses Faith, he loses Faith, right? So it is symbolic. But there's also some ambiguity there. Does he really lose faith? He clearly loses faith because in the end of the story, he is bitter. He has lost his faith. But does he really? Has he really lost her? Is this something that has really happened? So there we have ambiguity. We don't know what has happened. So we have several levels going on there. We have allegory, we have symbolism, and we have ambiguity. And we have three, I think questions that get us deeper and deeper and deeper into the ambiguity of the story. And these are those questions. Why does Brown go into the forest? Uh, what happens to them, him there? And number three, why does he emerge a permanently bittered, embittered man? Now, all these questions have literal answers. We know why for instance, Brown went into the forest. We know what happened to him there. We know ostensibly why he became a permanently embittered man. But there are also deeper answers to those questions and deeper questions to those answers, and that's why they're ambiguous. Because of the depth of ambiguity of the story, it really allows for some interesting interpretations and there are two large areas of interpretation. Number one is the basic literal level. And that is the journey is an absolutely real creation of the devil. And that is sort of the allegorical John Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress, Puritan level interpretation. And that I don't think is what Hawthorne was going for. If Hawthorne had been writing in the 1650s as opposed to the 1850s, then yes, he would have been. That's the story he would have been writing. Well, this is 200 years later, so that's not the story he was writing. The journey is more than likely some form of dream or delusion. Is it a dream or is it a delusion? Is it his delusion or a delusion of Satan? Now that would be the question. Um, so it is conjured up by the devil, or is it a product of Brown's own imagination, or is it both? Is it something created by the devil that is then carried on by his imagination? There are many aspects of the story that point to this being a dream or delusion that we can look to specifically the fact that the narrator's objective perceptions undermine what Brown is thinking. The narrator describes, for instance, when Brown sees the old man's cane turn into a snake, that it might have been an ocular deception created by the light. Um, the narrator talks about something fluttering down from the sky when Brown sees the pink ribbon fall down. Basically, the narrator provides perceptions that are different from Brown's perceptions. So it provides that sort of different perspective that allows us to think that maybe Brown is not exactly hearing, seeing the things that he thinks he's hearing and seeing. Of course, we're also dealing with witches and warlocks and brooms and those other things that are clearly fantastical and not real. So it makes it fairly easy for us to think that maybe it's his Puritan imagination getting away, getting away from him. This is 
Hawthorne's major critique of the Puritan imagination, this concept that sin is everywhere. He even brings in snatches of dialogue from Cotton Mather that he puts in the mouths of different people, uh, characters from his past and Salem witch trials. He puts in bits and pieces that are historically true. The old man tells young Goodman Brown that Brown's grandfather and father had participated in whipping Quakers and setting fires to Indian villages, all of these things that actually happened. So it's a little bit of historical truth-telling as well. Moving on now to Melville's Bartleby the Scrivener. It's subtitled A Story of Wall Street, and I always like to tell students uh, Bartleby is like the 19th century version of Office Space. Is that Bartleby is basically uh, Office Space without any of the comedy. Bartleby the Scrivener was really, in, in a lot of ways, was kind of a revolutionary short story that its, its setting was new, uh, writing a story about the new uh, sort of capitalist world of Wall Street, writing a story set in sort of that urban setting of the business world, the office world was, was really a brand new thing in America. And writing about a character as curious and as odd as, as Bartleby was a new thing. And you might say, well, why in the world did he write it anyway? But I really like the story. I think it's got a lot of uh, comic touches. If you look for it, of course, the characters of Turkey and Nippers and how you know one is can only work in the morning and one can only work in the afternoon. And the, the boss, the narrator, who really is just the worst person manager of an office you could possibly imagine you know he keeps hiring people just because the people that he that works for him really can't do their job and then he gets Bartleby who ends up refusing to do his job it's really just hysterical and ridiculous so it does function on that level of sort of the comic story uh, but it functions on some other levels as well as a critique of capitalist society, of a critique of sort of the alienation of urban society, the alienation of of the workplace, and of course, like I said, of you know, of the office space, if you will. You know, Bart will be working in a screened off corner, up against a uh, a wall. Uh, he has a window that faces basically a uh, a courtyard with. All he faces is a brick wall. It's much like the cubicle world of today's office spaces. There's office politics. There's infighting. There's the inhumanness of the kind of work that he does. He's a copyist, which is basically a human Xerox machine. And Bartleby himself is kind of a machine, or he becomes kind of a machine, and he becomes a machine that eventually doesn't work at all. I would like you to focus on the narrator, because it, it is really his story, even though the story's titled Bartleby. It's the narrator's story, and we're, we're really to focus on whether the narrator changes. He looks at him as billeted upon me by providence, by God, as someone who is his responsibility. But it is, in the end, a responsibility that he kind of shirks, you might say, I mean, Bartleby does end up in prison and end up dead. So does he really take on that responsibility? At the very end, he offers a postscript where he says he finds out a little bit more about Bartleby and that Bartleby had worked in the dead letter office. And he seems to be using that by way of explanation that maybe it's that job in the dead letter office that explains something about the way Bartleby is. I would offer that that really doesn't explain anything about Bartleby because is a job in the dead letter office really any worse than being a human copy machine as a law copyist? Finally, what is the significance of these American romantics that we've been studying, Poe and Melville and Hawthorne? Uh, first is that they brought a new level of complexity and depth to American literature. They brought in the symbolism, the ambiguity, the, the different contradictions to the work. They were highly influential on later American writers, on the English and European writers of the 20th century, on poetry, on fiction, on short fiction, on the novel. They built and rebuilt many of the American myths that we still write about and think about today and pioneered and explored many of the genres that we still write in today.